your cameras. Um, so I'm Vilma Vanessa, I'm an assistant professor in Wageningen University and I will be hosting this body community seminar. Uh, my own research involves uh, studying inflorescence development in Bali. And for this, I'm actually happy also that Thorsten is uh, willing to present because much of his work also involves uh, identifying genes that impact on the body and fluorescence development. So uh, Thorsten uh, will today also present some of this work on this. So the main focus of his lab is on the genetic and molecular uh, control of uh, spike and spikelet development. Um, because both organs are, of course, crucial for determining grain yield potential in both barley and wheat. Uh, for the research within his lab, they uh, use natural variants from wheat and induce uh, spike mutations in both barley and wheat to clarify how those genes um, influence the, the phenotypes in those uh, lines. Uh, as tradition in our barley community seminars, uh, Followed by the presentation of Thorsten, one of the people from his lab, uh, Jung Yu Hang, I hope I pronounced that correctly, will present also of his, uh, about his work. So Jung Yu uh, did his PhD at the Chinese Agricultural University, and since 2018, he's, he joined the group of Thorsten Snubus at the IPK in Katersleben. Um, he works both on natural uh, barley populations and induced mutants to study spikelet survival. And of course, this is also a key yield determinant. I would like to ask you all to keep your questions till both presentations are, uh, are concluded. So first, Thorsten will present this work and afterwards directly, uh, Jong Yu will present this work and then there will be time for questions to both speakers. Uh, so, Thorsten, today we will hear more about uh, your work and what you have done on uh, uh, the insights uh, about the insights of uh, pre emphasis and tip generation in body inflorescence. And I would like to hand over the words to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Wilma, for this uh, nice words and introduction. I'm trying to share now, see how it works. It worked a few minutes ago. Can you see it? Can you hear? Can you see it? We I can, can see, see it, it and I can hear. It. Thank you. Looks great. Yep. Um, you see it? Yeah, I can also see it. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I have two screens, that's why I had to uh, look around a little bit. Um, anyways, uh, let me get the point as well. Maybe that's a bit easier. Yeah, should be fine. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, Wilma. And um, yeah, today we'd like to talk about um, your yeah, work we've been conducting in the last five, six years, actually, in the uh, framework of an ERC project. And this is related to pre this tip degeneration of the barley inflorescence. And we'd like to give you a few insights here. Um, and um, you can see on the left hand side an autofluorescence picture of an immature spike of barley. And the red coloration actually is um, indicative for uh, chlorophyll. And uh, the, this chlorophyll coloration, uh, you, will, you will be seeing this uh, quite frequently in the presentation. So it's, it's a kind of a reappearing feature. <clears throat> but, but first of all, before we start, just a brief introduction at least um, about uh, something uh, we've been working on in the last year. So how does actually something like a, a, a mature spike you can see on the right hand side actually develop? And normally um, in, 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 in conventional Bali, um, Bali is shifting through, shifting its meristem identities. And as you can see, uh, at the yeah, top of the, the inflorescence, there's the inflorescence meristem, which is a stem cell population. And, and these, yeah, the activity of the stem cells actually give rise to the following meristems. Uh, and, uh, and the spikelet meristems produce the spikelets, and uh, the floral meristem produces the, the floral organs and the, uh, yeah, 
which are important for grain development later on. And this is uh, the typical progression through which a, a yeah, immature barley spike has to go. And what is also very typical is that you have this kind of developmental gradient along the spike. So the, let's say, more epical located meristems are in an earlier stage, like here triple spike meristem, for example, in comparison to the middle part or center part of the spike. And uh, the, the stages for uh, for the spikes are usually determined based on the most developed um, yeah, primordia, just for a clarification here. Um, yeah, so what is actually pre-anthesis tip degeneration? And I would like to give you a brief introduction into this. Uh, when we are looking at um, something like an yeah, adult or completely mature uh, spike, we can see clearly here the grains and the, uh, the awns. However, in order to kind of produce this type of structure, the, 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 um, the immature spike you can see on the left hand side has to kind of undergo certain developmental processes. For example, when you look at the basal part of the, the immature spike, normally there are around two to three nodes which are usually underdeveloped and which are usually do not make any useful yeah, grain setting. So in, 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 in all our analysis, you are seeing here, these three basal ones are actually really uh, omitted. So we don't look at them. Uh, then we have this kind of yeah, center part of the spike, which usually is the part which is setting the grain. And this is actually the part what you can see on the right hand side where you really all the grains are filled. While on, on the immature spike, you can also see here the, um, yeah, what we call um, epical part, which is uh, going to be degenerating. And you can see here in these images at the top, um, at what Beddington stages, these, um, yeah, these epical part is degenerating. Uh, and on average, let's say across all of these um, yeah, genotypes we've been looking at, it's around one third of the spikelets which are initially produced are actually uh, degenerating. So this means we are actually losing here around one third of our uh, grain yield potential. So if we can try to understand this degeneration plus, uh, process a little bit better and, and deeper, maybe it's possible to uh, save uh, some of these degenerating spikelets for future grain production. And by this, we actually can increase or even stabilize uh, yeah, grain yield, grain yields or as spike, um, spike grain yields and grain number determination per spike. However, when we started this project, there was not really much known about the molecular mechanisms related to this spike uh, or pre-anthesis tip degeneration, which is in the following always called PTD, just to make it a bit easier for, yeah, for talking about it. Okay, um, uh, one, one person who's been starting to work in this project was Chanda, and he's now postdoc in Maria von Korf's lab in, in Düsseldorf. And uh, when he started to work and to look into more details, let's say cellular details of PTD, uh, he very quickly found out that, um, let's say, over the progression of, of the inflorescence meristem at, at the tip of the um, epical meristem, I mean, that, that, that the, the dome size is uh, actually changing over time. And uh, the, the older the, the, yeah, the spike becomes, the, the smaller is um, also the dome size and it's actually reducing in size. And that was already quite an interesting observation um, that um, even though the spike is growing actually bigger, the, the epical dome is becoming smaller, suggesting that maybe the, 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 the cells in, in this, um, in this dome actually consumed and provide the basis for the, the down, um, the, the, the lower laying spikelets. Anyway, um, Chanda and in collaboration with uh, another scientist from IPK here, Tuan Rütten, they looked into these um, yeah, different stages of development, as you can see here, and they were trying to um, actually really count the numbers of um, mitotically, mitotically active cells within this um, yeah, dome of epical meristem. And you can see here some, some cells which are in an active uh, cell dividing state. And, um, and this is suggesting, so in this particular stage, um, the, 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 the meristem is still actively dividing because you can still find dividing cells. And then they actually looked into this and tried to 
um, yeah, account for the number of how many dividing cells they see at what particular stage. And they found that from, for example, around Weddington five to six, um, many of the yeah, mitotic activity within this dome is actually starting to stop. And uh, actually the, the um, mitotic arrestron actually moves downward, so basipetally. So this means that um, actually the initiation of this stop of, or the, the in, induction of the degeneration process starts really in, in these stages after five, Weddington five, and actually moves downwards. So that was already a quite interesting finding when he started his, his project. And uh, another PhD student in the project, Nandakuma Shanmugaraj, I mean, he was trying to understand what are actually the molecular yeah, mechanisms underlying this degeneration process. So since we, we have been working on yeah, uh, spike development for some time, and you might remember a recent publication we had in 2017 where we showed these hormonal gradients, we were actually also speculating that most likely maybe hormonal uh, dysregulation uh, might also be uh, a, a factor on this. However, we were we were thinking that we might have something like growth repressors, which are actually wor working from the top and growth promoters, which are um, working from the base. And we also certainly wanted to um, yeah, consider assimilates and what, what roles do actually assimilates play in spike PTD in, in this particular case. Um, and Nanakuma followed here in particular two um, uh, approaches. I cannot talk about all of them today. But he did a transcriptome analysis and also a metabolome analysis, and he he um, identified very very interesting patterns um, how how this uh, spike PTD is actually um, induced. One of the uh, the, the first um, things he wanted to do was to kind of um, standardize, for example, experiments. In, in a specific cultivar under specific growth conditions in the greenhouse in order to determine really um, how this um, PTD is induced. And as you know, Bowman is a very um, yeah, popular cultivar in our community. So he used the two road cultivar Bowman. And you can see here um, in different experiments, it's very, very clear um, how many maximum number of cyclopromodia are produced and actually also at what stage this degeneration process is induced. So actually the number of spikelets and the spikelets primordia aborting and degenerating are very well um, yeah, um, determined. And, it, and this is actually very predictable under, a certain, under certain conditions under, uh, within a certain cultivar. And here you can see again in, at the different stages, um, just in red uh, colored, the, the actual spikelets which are going to be aborted in this cultivar and only from let's say Weddington stage 7.5 you actually see here at the top that uh, that uh, the, the primordia are visibly uh, going to die. Nanda was also very interested to see what's going on on the cellular level and he was applying a cell death marker in order to see how actually does this uh, the cell death occur and where, where does it come from or how does it move in particular? And it's very clear that really the first initiation of any cell death in the degeneration process is around seven. So it's coinciding with a yeah, visible death initiation. And it's really starting in, in this epical end of the, of the inflorescence in, in this stem cell population. But then it moves, when it moves down, interestingly, when you look at this image here, for example, you see uh, the purple colorations in, in indicating uh, plant cell death uh, processes, and they are not actually um, starting necessarily in, in the, for example, underlying rachis tissue. No, they are starting first in the underlying florets in the anthers. So the anthers of the underlying florets are the, or the, let's say, developing anthers, are the first uh, tissues which are undergoing plant cell death before then the whole florid uh, primordium uh, dies off and then later on also the rachis tissue is dying. So it's very interesting pattern to see. First of all, it's starting really in, this, in the inflorescence meristem and when it moves downwards, it's actually affecting the, 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 the lower um, florid primordia primarily first in the, in the, in the developing anthers. 
Yeah, Nanakuma also performed a lot of experiments, but one of one of them was also a transcriptome analysis. I just would like to briefly highlight a few points he was finding. Um, so what, uh, let's say, um, functional terms, biological relevant functional terms have been identified. So, for example, here you can see this um, this gray bar indicating this is the apical part of the spike, and you see the three spike stages. And you can clearly see here the, the, the red terms are all terms related to, in particular, senescence, ABA signaling, or regulation of cell death. And it's very much occurring in the later stages of after 6 in 7.5. Um, in, in comparison to, to this, uh, when you look at the basal part, it's very clear that uh, the basal part is not undergoing any degeneration or so. It's really highly fertile. And interestingly, here we find a lot of, um, yeah, yeah, pro promoting processes, in particular, uh, photosynthesis-related processes and plastid organization. So chloroplast organization and developmental processes were very important in the basal and central parts of the of the spike. So there's a clear distinction between, let's say, apical part associated with cell death, ABA, and senescence. Um, um, uh, processes while the central and basal parts are rather involved with uh, yeah, normal development, photosynthesis, and chloroplast dif uh, differentiation. Um, Nanakuma also showed this actually, um, for example, that uh, there's a really chloroplast um, generation in, in the developing spike. Um, and you can see that here is using this um, MALDI technology. Uh, metabolite analysis, and you can see here the this yellowish um, pattern is actually the developing rachis. And since the rachis is the green part here in in the developing rachis, this is uh, displaying very clearly the chlorophyll content of the rachis, and suggesting that um, yeah we really have uh, chlorophyll production here, most likely because it's green, also some photosynthetic activity. Um, this is was in very much in line with the previous work done also by um, by by Yong Yu, and uh, yeah, this this paper was um, earlier published this year, and uh, in this particular case he was dealing with the um, TST2 mutant, and here also this uh, TST2 mutant is a very extreme case of of uh, cell death induction, and here it was very clear also that um, the the chlorophyll content in the TST2 mutant was severely affected, negatively affected, and because of that, also uh, there was a lot of uh, spikelet degeneration going on in, in the TST2 mutant. And this uh, TST2 mutant underlying gene was uh, a CMF4. It's a CMF4. It's a it's a transcription factor, um, which is um, yeah involved in in many in different things, but most likely also in the induction of chlorophyll and plus differentiation. Interestingly, uh, also Yong Yu found in his his study on TST2 that this inflorescence meristem or inflorescence greening or the greening of an immature spike seems to be very prominent or prevalent in particular in cold season grasses. So we we, we could see this in brachypodium, but also not, certainly in, in 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 rye, in wheat, and also in barley. So you can see here in these these images, they all have this. This very green rachis tissue, um, which is uh, completely absent in the tropical grasses like sorghum, um, rice, um, or for example also maize, they they all don't have this. And uh, this is this is a per se an interesting feature, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. <clears throat> anyway, just to highlight again what Yong Wu has found about the the TST2. Um, here again on the left hand side, you see a normal Bowman spike. And you can clearly see the red coloration indicating the chlorophyll. And interestingly, when you look at here, also you can see that the 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 the, the chlorophyll, which is um, in indicating the rachis tissue, is actually branching off towards the spikelet. So each spikelet is kind of connected with the rachis, also with um, with this kind of um, air tissue which is formed actually in order to connect spikelet with rachis tissue. And the, the question was, um, how, how does it actually look like? And we were looking into this in more detail together with Twan again. And here, I just wanted to share with you again this, um, 
yeah this this uh, better resolution of this image so what you what you can actually see in 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 the bowman and in the mutant is that for example the 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 chlorophyll coloration usually comes from cells which are surrounding the vasculature as you can see here so here's a um, non autofluorescence image of of the tissue and you can see here with an auto autofluorescence image clearly the, the the cells which are producing uh, chloroplasts and in in the center you see the, the 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 yeah the vascular bundles and that's very interesting so suggesting here there is a very close connection between vascularization of the spike in the presence and absences of the chlorophyll um, or chloroplast development so suggesting here a very very strong link between chloroplast biogenesis chlorophyll production and the connectivity between let's say spikelet and the rachis tissue so may, maybe making making a link here in terms of uh, if if there is no let's say connectivity as we can see here uh, uh, between the, the the spikelet and the rachis most likely there's a high chance that that this spikelet will not develop and will degenerate very quickly so th this this um this link was very clearly established in the tst two mutant okay um coming to to um to to a first summary of the presentation so just to give you a little bit of a yeah um overview about what uh, nanda and and yong we have found out um in, in their analysis it was very very clear that for example you need cmf4 gene as part of the chloroplast differentiation and chlorophyll biosynthesis pathway in order to promote um, um yeah, spikelet growth. Um, on the other hand, um, Nanda Kumar also found a lot of other things which are actually suppressing um, the the development of the developing spikelets at the tip, and they are more mainly associated with um, yeah higher ROS production, increased ABA biosynthesis, or chlorophyll, or other cellular uh, catabolic processes, and. Um, Overall, what can, one can say maybe that, that PPD uh, is associated in particular with aging and senescence, light reactions, and defense or immune responses. Yeah, so we have this kind of um, promoting effects coming from, from the base, let's say, from chloroplast development differentiation, but also we have from the top the, the repressing functions. And here in particular, I mean, I don't want to show too much here because I, simply because of time. I mean, Nanakuma also found in his transcript analysis that um, the, the, the Bali GT1, so grassy tillers one gene has been a repressive function in, 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 in Bali. And I just would like to quickly share this with you. So um, based on the, on the transcriptome data set, it was suggested that a, GT1 is highly expressed in the infrescence meristem. And we pursued a transgenic approach and knocked it out in Bali. And the, the GT1 mutant in Bali actually produced here, you can see it, um, more extra surviving spikelets. However, uh, the effect was not that strong that these spikelets were producing any additional grains. However, it was quite clearly confirmed that GT1 has this suppressive function in terms of um, yeah, uh, spikelet growth in the, in the apical part of the spike. Okay, um, these are... Um, in particular things which have been published. And now in the second half of my, my talk, I would like to um, uh, share with you a, a few unpublished results. In order to come to that point, I would like to, to share with you some, um, yeah, some work on natural diversity of spikelet survival or spike PTD in Bali. And this is mainly work done by a PhD student in my group, Rup Kamal and also Yong Yu. Um, as you have seen before, we have been working on GT1, which is like an, an yeah, CRISPR-Cas induced mutant and uh, TSD2 mutant was an induced mutant from mutagenesis program. But here in, in this part of the talk, I would like to show you a little bit of, let's say, what is a genetic natural variation for spike PDD in, in, the, in, in a certain barley collection. And here we have been working on a, on a big population, which we developed together with Martin and, and Niels at the IPK. It's, uh, it's uh, pr primarily or only six row types in more than 400 genotypes representing here the kind of diversity space of, of, of Bali from 
yeah, the continents you can see here, which have been in included. And we have been sequencing these more than 400 accessions with a, approximately 3x coverage. And we, the end, in the end, gathered around 22 million SNPs. And after having yeah, this very large population of 400 in the uh, yeah, genotypes of six rod barley and 22 million SNPs, this, we were in a very good position of doing some field experiments and doing some GWAS analysis for spike PTD. And this is what um, Yong Yu and Rup has been have been doing actually in, in their projects. I mean, Rup has been primarily working on in the field environment in the years 2018, 19, and 20, and has been identifying here uh, three major um, uh, yeah, genomic regions on different chromosomes of barley. And um, I would like to share with you one of them, which is on chromosome 3, 3H. And you can see here the, you know, the higher resolution of the three uh, chromosome regions, where you can see where they are located. For example, chromosome 1H is located in the really epi, um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, upper end of the chromosome 1H, while um, the the chromosome 3H, which I would like to focus on, is um, yeah also in rather in the beginning of chromosome 3H. Here it was very interesting because uh, this interval was rather small; it only had like around 300 kb, um, and in this in this interval we only had like one high confidence genes and two additional low confidence genes, and uh, the high confidence gene was uh, related to an Arabidopsis gene, which has been already um, described before. It's called Arabidopsis RAP, and it's an octotricopeptide repeat protein in Arabidopsis, and it seemed to be involved in chloroplast maturation. And uh, yeah, the corresponding publication was in plant in 2014, and that was certainly a good candidate since we have been having this link with chloroplast development. Looking into this gene was certainly also Quite quite useful. So um, besides that, there was also a rice paper um, from the same gene, and also here similar phenotypes. Um, the rice um, mutants called albino leaf one show this. Um, this um, I mean, if if the genes are completely knocked out, it's uh, actually a lethal mutation, and the and the, the the seedlings are stopping to grow because they are completely albino. Um, and uh, yeah, this was also very, very important information for us when we were doing the mutagenesis, for example, of this gene. Yeah, bef but before we, um, be before I talk about the mutagenesis of RAP in Bali, I would like to quickly share with you what we found in the in the collection of the Bali population. So in total, I can say maybe we identified, let's say, two major haplotypes of this gene. Um, and you can see here in yellow the parts where you find amino acid substitutions. And you can see here at the, at the bottom, this pinkish part is the so-called RAP domain of the protein, which is important for, uh, for the activity or function of the protein. And here we have this green uh, amino acid substitution, uh, which is very um, in a very important position because uh, we compared it to all of the other RAP uh, proteins in the other graph or, or uh, plant species. And this is a very, very conserved um, amino acid which, which has been changed, suggesting actually that this protein might not be completely functional anymore. And when we looked at the um, yeah at the population level, um, how actually is PTD um, yeah, distributed among the different um, carriers of the alleles? So we have here 84 um, yeah, accessions which have a certain haplotype. And we have here uh, the majority of the accessions having a, a different haplotype. And we clearly see here significant differences in terms of PTD. So um, in this particular case, um, the, the T haplotype is clearly having a, a, a lower um, degeneration, suggesting it has a higher survival. And uh, that's why most likely. Um, we also have here a majority of the accessions, while let's say the the the, the lower allele, um, we only have 84 accessions in the panel. We also checked the, the expression pattern of this gene, and it was completely expressed in, in different parts of the spike, as you can see here. And it's also, yeah, it has a kind of 
more or less good expression level in many different spike stages. Um, we also certainly looked into the, the RAP gene haplotypes and also in tilling alleles, as I said before. And for the tilling allele, we collaborated with a group in Poland. And um, here we were using the, the, the cultivar Sebastian, which have been used for tilling. And um, you can see here on the cellular level um, how the chloroplasts are looking like in, in the wild type Sebastian. And here you can see uh, one of the alleles, RAPG, um, which we actually found uh, where the, 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 in the mutant version of this family, um, the, the, the chlorophylls are, yeah, are affected and it's um, actually having a lower chlorophyll content. And that was also shown here, for example, in this, in this graph, um, all the mutants, uh, for example, in, in the population carrying this specific allele in the haplotype 2 had a slightly lower uh, chlorophyll level in the leaf, but most, most strikingly a very strong reduction in, in the chlorophyll content of the spike, as, so the immature spike. So, and here again, most likely this was uh, causative for um, a, higher, <clears throat> a higher PTD in the haplotype 2, and that resulted in lower spikelet number on the population level, really suggesting here that there's some natural variation in this RAP, uh, RAP domain containing protein, which is providing some, some uh, yeah, natural variation for PTD. Um, but we were not only checking for the effects of chlorophylls in, in, the, in the mutants of RAP, we were also obviously interested in, does it really affect also the, the grand number per spike? And as you can see here very clearly, it, it actually does. So we have here different families of the RAPG allele, and we have here the wild type allele, we have here the heterozygous, and we have the mutant allele. And here very clearly in, in, this, in this family of the RAPG mutants, um, we, we clearly see a grand number effect, suggesting that um, certain alleles of this RAP are really important for um, yeah, determining the extent of, of spike PDD in barley. Okay. Coming to the to the end, um, what are the take home measures from my talk? Um, um, I think we can say that barley spike PTD is definitely uh, developmentally programmed, while it's, its uh, extent is genotype and environment dependent. I think that's a very important point. So it's it's a developmental developmentally regulated program. However, each genotype uh, has differences here, and also certainly environmental differences play a role. For example, if you induce, um, you can certainly have more PTD if, if you are inducing drought tolerant, uh, drought, drought conditions, for example, or, or water deficit. Um, the inflorescence meristem size reduction and deformation coincides with maximum yield potential stage. That's also uh, was a very, very important finding from Chanda's work. And also here at the last point, the molecular determinants of spike PTD are majorly associated with senescence like processes involving sugar and amino acid depletion. I haven't shown that data, but um, uh, yeah, and only in later stages, the a higher a ABA levels. I haven't shown you this data because of, of time reasons. So these are, let's say, um, in very brief essence, uh, the take home messages for spike PTD. However, there are still a few open questions related to this. What we still don't understand is what is or what are the signals determining the precise timing or initiation of spike PTD. So that's, that's pretty clearly not known until now, and we don't have really a, a clue here. So other question is, for example, what signal or how is actually PTD affected, um, or how, how are the PTD affected spike primordia marked? So, and in this case, what decides the extent of the death zone? So in other words, so how, how, how does actually the this uh, degeneration process stop at what what decides the stop of the degeneration processes? If you, for example, compare this with leaf senescence, normally a leaf is senescing from the tip to the base, so completely. But here in in the spike, it's not. So it, 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 genotype dependent, it's it's stopping at a certain point, and we have no idea why it's stopping at that particular point under these conditions. Another interesting question is what is the role of um, immature spike greening and perhaps photosynthesis during spike PTD? 
Um, and I think this in particular for, for to answer a little bit better the, this last question, we have been very recently initiated a PhD project. Um, this is a PhD project together with C plus um, Professor Andreas Weber from University of Dusseldorf. And Saiti uh, Jasper Bana, he's a PhD student who started in May this year on this project, and he's trying to answer a few of these these really interesting questions. So, how how um, why are grass species growing in colder climates have chloroplasts in the developing inflorescence? Is there any advantage in having chloroplasts in the developing inflorescence? And does the presence of chloroplasts signify that the tissue is maybe photosynthetically active? And if yes, then what? is its importance, for example. And I think this is these are still very interesting and fascinating questions. And and I'm I'm really looking forward to work here with Andreas in, in this interesting project. And um, yeah we are looking forward to to the future here. Just this was my last slide and I would like to certainly acknowledge the people in my group. I mean I've all people I've been using data of are here indicated in red. And yeah here you can see a table where we eat some pizza on the anniversary of 15 years plant architecture lab. <laughs> and yeah, certainly also would like to acknowledge my collaborators at IPK, uh, acknowledge collaborators outside of IPK, yeah, the, the, the group in Poland and certainly Uda for providing all of these interesting barley mutants we have been working with in the past and certainly the funders ERC, DFG and certainly also IPK. And with this, I would like to Stop here, stop sharing, and I would like to hand over to Yong Yu, who is um, telling you about one of his latest ideas, um, re also related to P spike PTD, hopefully. All right, thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. can yeah. Okay, and I, I hope you can also see the slides also. Yes, yes. you can see them. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, the invitation and also thanks for giving me this opportunity to present some of our work here. And as Torsten, Torsten has already talked a lot about this insight into pre ancestor generations, uh, actually, I cannot share the same title as him, but uh, today my talk may more about uh, the functional link with proximal internals. So it's basically, I shift a little bit to the vegetative tissues. Um, so first, I think Torsten has already given you an introduction of how this uh, spike PDD is happening. Here, uh, I just show you again, it's a spike a on promedia stage or around on promedia stage where it can produce a maximum number of spike promedia and finally uh, only a small proportion of the spike that can be fertile. And here is just a, an image showing how the degenerative spike look like. So uh, when we look a, the, this diverse six lobe spring body where Torsten has mentioned before, we can see that uh, overall the spagrid survival only represents only around 50%. So this means uh, another 50% is kind of waste during development. And before I go straight forward to the GWAS, I think Torsten has already mentioned, uh, I would like to also try to know how the overall plant development may affect this uh, particular spike, spike survivals. So here is a simple experiment where I got a wild type bowman in two different pots. In a, it's in a, one is a bigger one and another small one. So we can see that uh, in both pro, pros, both genotypes can produce similar number of pro, potential spike promedia. However, at final stage, in the small pool, we, we can see that the spike number is reduced. So this may suggest that uh, maybe this is something related to source limitations because of, for, to support the development of apical spike list. And so ha having this in mind, when we look into the directors about weight and body, 
I think there's, there are several papers, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, already suggesting that uh, the steam growth, so the steam elongation period is, is the most uh, critical stage that um, affecting the, maybe affecting the spaghetti survival in both wheat and barley. And some uh, summarize all, all this available literature, and of course, there are many more that you can all list here. And the summary of all this literature is that um, it seems there's a, a competition between the ear and the stem for resource at the time of highest growth rate. And also another important factor is the vascular, vascular system. Maybe it's uh, really critical during this, the growth of vegetative and lymphatic growth. And another, another research is coming from uh, Poston's lab. Uh, this, uh, this is done by uh, one of our postdoc called a uh, guy. So what he did is he growed a set of wheat near a uh, real population in two contrasting environments. One is in normal condition, one is with uh, green filters. So this is uh, called a similar kind of feed. And when he, he so he collect a set of vegetative and reproductive traits in both conditions and normalize. So when you divide the phenotypes uh, by normal conditions, we can see that uh, uh, here green color, I had I, I had uh, some uh, traits or interest with green color, is, uh, I term this as source tissues because this is like uh, some peduncle lens and some plant height and red color is related to the zinc tissues. So what guy has found is that, uh, for example, when we look at the uh, uh, plant height, it seems that it does not change too much uh, to, does not respond too much to this uh, stimulant canopy shade. And, but on the other hand, when he look at some specific internals, for example, the P minus one means the, the last second internals below the pitanko, uh, there's a slight decrease uh, after, uh, upon canopy shade. On the other hand, uh, the P minus three internal length, it seems it was it increased uh, outer sh shading. And what he also found is that the uh, spike number per spike did not change too much under shading, but grains per spike was decreased. So this really suggests uh, upon shading, perhaps spike rate survival is decreasing in weight. So I think guys' research kind of stimulate the following, the, this talk and the, the study, the, the following studies. Uh, so, and also, as I mentioned before, it seems that during uh, spaghetti survival is happening at a uh, steam elongation phases, and we may expect this trait could somehow be related to brown height. And however, when we when I look into the this uh, six low spring body populations, what we found is that uh, actually brown height is seems a uh, not significant correlation correlated with spaghetti survival. And um, so, as people working in in cereal crops may already know that uh, the height can be com is composed of several internals. For example, here is a phytomere unit or a, or a comes which is composed of a branch, an internal, and a bud. And um, so, height is the sum of each internals. And however, pre if uh, until now, it's not possible to uh, conduct genetic studies for each internals because uh, we know there's a huge variation so internal numbers across different genotypes and until now people may just focus on all they were only able to measure few digital internals such as the pitanko or maybe few or one or two more internals and no more and this may raise one question is about how about the proximal internals because uh, we, we were not able to compare the variations or let's say these particular internals across the natural population because some genotypes may have may not have so many internal numbers. So having these questions in mind, we or I use the same population which is this uh, six low spring bodies, and also I include another wild body. PC wild body negotiation lines, which is called HEP25. I think people may be very familiar with this population. 
and I conduct the experiments under greenhouse conditions. So first of all, I measure all the internal lens uh, from the peduncle until the very bottom uh, above the soil levels. And as expected, we find, of course, the variations of internal numbers. And when we plot the plants, which have been showing the stem numbers of internal together, we can see a pattern. So here, green color is the integral season and black color is the uh, diverse six low bodies. And what we found is that uh, there's a, there seems to be a concern pattern regardless of the internal number, which is kind of throwing like a, some, somehow like a S, reverse S curve. And when we localize all the inter variations of internal number together, so this is more can, is, can be explained by more by a, a QB functions. So this, uh, how it is interpreted is that uh, the integration of digital internal is, and the proximal internals are following uh, this uh, exponentially increase, whereas in the central part is more remain stable or in a plateau manner. So this suggests also that uh, the elongation internals can be basically divided into three sections, so-called the digital, central, and proximal. Uh, another interesting observation is that uh, the overall the two populations we see variations of so in this uh, GWAS population or this D6S, it has a, it tend to have longer proximal internals, whereas in this wild body populations in the Gaussian lines it has longer digital internals. And with this information, I think uh, I cannot apply a simple strategy to estimate the length of digital central and proximal internals. So this was nothing but just a, a moving average strategies. So with this approach, I think uh, we were able to then compare the variations of digital central and proximal internals. And here is uh, the repeatability, repeatability among the replicates in this wild well body populations. And I think which is quite high, Except for proximal internal is 0 0.65, but I think it's still good enough to for the uh, next uh, genetic studies. So having uh, ha having identified this uh, approach, we also we, we found that uh, uh, seems the elongation of digital and proximal internals seems to be quite independent. For example, here is the correlation of digital and central which is uh, highly correlated and central and proximal is also highly correlated. But when you look at it, digital and proximal, it seems both internals are more or less uh, independent. And on the other hand, when you look at the correlations of all these internals like digital, central, proximal, and also internal number, and also time length is the uh, proxy of ground height. When you look at this, how it may be correlated to spike survival. So what we found is that uh, out of these uh, uh, internal length parameters, only proximal internal length uh, has this strong negative correlation with spike survival. And of course, this is uh, just a statistical correlation, whether it may have some particular meanings. Uh, if we look at the penalty of body, we know that uh, so here is the transition from double rates until a uh, major stage. And we know the tip degeneration is somehow happened between on promedia stage and ancestors. And only when we look at the inauguration of proximal internal, it was uh, at this particular windows, which is overlay with the tip degeneration process. And after this, uh, then the inauguration of digital internals or the peduncles happens. So here we can say that uh, at this uh, particular level, this uh, two process, the proximal internals and spike PVDD, they are overlaid, or they are co-occurrence at this between uh, this stage. So this uh, first uh, suggests that uh, the correlation we found may have some biological meanings. And secondly, we found also so we also measure the CAM biomass. So of course, it's contributed by digital, central, and proximal. Uh, 
But uh, here we can also regress this internal lens, this is three internal lens with the biomass. So this can give us an impression of how each lens components can contribute to total CAM biomass. And here what we found is, uh, seems the central internode or the digital internodes seems to have uh, almost no significant correlations with uh, CAM biomass. Uh, but uh, in terms of proximal internal lens, uh, less than significant contributions to the total CAM biomass. So this suggests that uh, proximal internodes are more costly to build. And uh, here we also use uh, this THT mutant as Torsten has mentioned before. Uh, so in this mutant, there's a fit both mutant has uh, both mutant and wild type produce the same number of internals. I think this give us a good validation whether uh, this uh, internal lens from the proximal end is somehow cor correlated to spaghetti survival. So what we found in this is that in this mutant, the digital or the proximal internal here, like internal five and six, in the THT mutant, which has stronger degenerations, so it also produces longer internals. So this uh, provides a second layer of evidence that uh, there's a large correlation relationship between proximal internal elongation and spec PDD. And finally, as I mentioned before, or address, uh, highlight before, the stem elongation and the vascular uh, differentiations could be uh, functionally linked to spike PDD. Here we identify the culture genes underlying TST, and uh, this gene is also expressed in the uh, vascular cells. Particularly here, it looks like a pro, uh, proto proyom cells. And in summarize, I think all this observation uh, suggests uh, less uh, functional link between proximal internal elongation and uh, spike PDD. And also, uh, muscular differentiation seems to be the critical during this process. I think this reinforced the uh, finding of Kirby uh, in proposed in 1988. Uh, next, I just uh, talked about the genetics study in this wild body integration lines, and we identified uh, independently for digital central and proximal internals uh, two peaks. So. You may already made a note that uh, this peak is correspondent to PBDH1, and the second peak on chromosome stretch is correspondent to CMT01 or called tensor. And what uh, I found interesting is uh, the band effect or each internal component, internal lens is kind of shift from uh, PBT1 to CMT1, CMT1 when we uh, move from proximal to digital. For example, in the PPT1 seems to be uh, not responsible for digital internals, but uh, it is the main player for proximal internal lens. Whereas for CMT1, it's responsible for all the three internal lens components. Uh, another interesting observation is that uh, both two genes seem to be heavier synergistically, in particular for proximal internal lens. Uh, because when you uh, combine both alleles, the effect is much higher than, or is uh, two times more than the single allele effect. So this also suggests that there's, there could be a, a molecular interactions of PPD1 and CMT1. And this was also validated with a simple approach by incubating the pro promoter or the intron region of CMT1 with functional or reduced functional PBDH1. And what we observe is that uh, indeed uh, the functional PBDH1 was able to induce the transcripts of uh, this receptor race driven by the promoter of, of CMT1. And I think this also support the synergistic uh, effect of both genes. And next also we of course find that the PBT1 uh, is involved in also spike PBD and also it promotes proximal internal lens in a photoperiod dependent manner. As uh, we can see in this uh, near acetylene line, BW281, it has a longer proximal internal lens compared to bone mass under long day conditions. But this effect disappears uh, when we move to short day conditions. 
And the, on the left side is the image or uh, premature spike. Here we can see this uh, PBTH1 negotiation lines. The, the, the tip cannot degenerate much earlier than wild type bowman under long day conditions. But uh, under short day conditions, the development of the spike lines are much uh, promoted and supporting the, the, the PBT1 pro promote both trade and also this kind of reinforce our previous observation that uh, proximal internal lens is functionally linked to spike PDD. Uh, so a possible model for PBT1 and CMUT1 story is that uh, overall this gene is going to be involved in uh, GA uh, metabolisms and GA I think is well known for uh, all kinds of internal elongations. So CBT1 is in charge of both digital central and proximal internals. And on the other PBT1 seems to be much specific to the proximal end by targeting to CMUT1. And I think there, of course, will be some other factors, unknown factors that may be in charge of digital internal innovations other than CMUT1. And I think one possible hypothesis that why PBT1, PBTH1 is only in charge of proximal internal lens is that uh, when we look at the whole plant community levels, we know that uh, at a proximal end, uh, there are several uh, micro environments that are much distinct compared with digital and such as, uh, for example, light conditions because of the canopy shed. So, uh, in, to summarize, I think this graph uh, already gives the overall talk of the, the day, which, uh, first of all, uh, body stem internal innovation is dynamic, and proximal internal is more costly to build compared with uh, digital and central ones. And during which, during the inauguration of proximal internals, flow generation is, is happening. And also at this process, uh, PDD is uh, determined most likely. And vascularization seems to be a key determinant, determinant of both process. And uh, I think this, the inauguration of digital internals and spike degeneration are both energy demand, high, high energy demanding and they may compete with each other for resource allocation. And I think an outlook is that a further genetic study on these proximal internal innovations may provide insights into sourcing balance under community environment, uh, wherein canopy shed is very prevalent. And with this, I uh, like to thank uh, all the cooperators within and outside IPK, including Klaus Peter and Andres Mora to provide for providing the wire body integration lines. And also, uh, yes, Martin Murut and Andrew Bona to for the, this uh, GWAS population, and Yusen and Goliang in IPK for data analyze. And also, uh, uh, Ingri Robot and Hauje for the help of this uh, body protoplasting and research acid, and uh, NKR for the greenhouse plant care. And also, I'd like to thank all the PPB members for their helpful discussions. And also, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. So, thank you, uh, Young Yu and Corson, for those excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that personally. So, for me, it was a lot of fun to see how much beautiful work you've done on those topics. Uh, I would like to open the floor to questions. You can type them in the chat box. Um, you can try raising your hand, but I can't guarantee that I will see them. But I don't know if anyone has a hand up at the moment. But Can I be so bold to start with a question? <laughs> so, Jong-Yu, um, you said something yeah. about PPDs one being upstream of SDW1. Yeah, um, and that it would bind to the promoter region. Uh, so, yes. what kind of experiment have you done to show that this is a direct interaction? Uh, so, we just did one simple experiment, which is this uh, Luciferis acid, where we mm -hmm. fused the coding regions of PBTH1 from both functional and non functional. And we always express this uh, together with uh, the Luciferis gene driven mm -hmm. by the promoter of. CMUT01 together, and we then detect the 
activity or this experience yeah. only this one and also we have some uh previous published data from maria from uh, where uh he, she kind of uh use analytic or pbdh one we found cbt one is uh, highly uh, differential regulated in this analytic data set mm -hmm. so and um uh, if you look to this promoter region so and if you mutate that binding site in your in silico experiment do you then still see binding of your pbdh one so do you know the core binding site of pbdh one what what sequence is recognized uh no this i have no idea I think uh, there are some researchers uh, talking about CCT genes, which may bind to, I think, uh, it, it may need some cofactors uh, to bind to, to recognize to, I don't remember the exact motif, but it seems to be the four base pair uh, call sequence that is in charge of CCT genes. Yeah. But, uh, for sure, there, there, there are some motif present in CMTO1, but I, I don't have experimental data to validate whether this is very important or not. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if in the meanwhile somebody has other questions for Torsten or I see something in the chat from Robbie. Um uh, Robbie just shout maybe. <laughs> maybe just Yeah, I was just I was interested in that there are other barley mutants or phenotypes or alleles that either promote increased number of um, grain per spike or decreased grain per spike and I was wondering whether there was an interaction between any of these genes and CMF4. That's to either of you. Uh, or just say that's a stupid question. Sorry, can you repeat your question? The question's in the chat so if you want to read it so if you're having difficulty with my accent. Uh, mm. Yeah, to be to be honest, um, we, so we, we, we haven't tested this, but uh, what I can say is uh, the red domain gene is differentially expressed in this uh, CHT2B RNA seq data set. Yeah. Sorry, which gene? Uh, so what I can say is the red domain gene uh, Torsten has just present is differentially expressed in CMF4 or in TST2B mutant? I think, uh, John Gil, you're answering now the question of uh, Luke Ramsey instead of the one of Robbie. So, Robbie was asking about the interaction between CMF4 and other spike mutants uh, that promote or reduce spike number, like, for example, interaction between CMF4 and the VOS1 deficient mutant. Uh, so, that, that was the question of Robbie. And then the other question of Luke, maybe we can. Uh, go to afterwards. Um, um, maybe I can try to answer Robbie's question. Um, I think it would be certainly good to maybe cross the TST2 mutant to maybe other mutants what we have, and also maybe to, for example, one of these GT1 mutants um, from the trans transgenic approach that we haven't done that yet, but it, it's certainly possible to, to see how that kind of interacts most likely. Yeah. Um, uh, Talking about TST mutants, as far as I know, there are only two TST mutants. So there's TST1 and TST2. And, and from our analysis, we know that TST1 is not allelic with TST2, for example. So they are really different um, loci and different genes. So they are also, um, uh, the TST1 phenotype is not as severe as the TST2 phenotype is, for example. Um, that's something I can, I can say. Um, and related to VRS1 or deficiencies, um, uh, there was always a speculation maybe that, uh, uh, let's say, a functional VRS1, so a two road allele, um, might affect also the degeneration process. Um, and since we did not want to find, let's say, um, yeah, this, this, this gene effect in our GWAS analysis, we were, we were deciding to actually only look into six road types, so where VRS1 is knocked out. And just to eliminate this, this row type effect from the GWAS analysis, um, that's why we were choosing the six row um, panel only. Yeah. Um, and about, can I also answer Luke's question? Uh, yes, go ahead. I would say. Huh? Um, yeah, I, I can only I can only speculate about why maybe twenty percent of these um, yeah land races have maintained this allele. 
Um, yeah, this is certainly speculation from my point of view, but um, um, it, it could well be that under some circumstances, maybe having, I mean, obviously this is an, uh, still functional allele. However, there are some, let's say some compromise in terms of uh, grand number per spike, um, but still the, the plants are viable and they are producing spikes. So it's not a lethal mutation. That's something we have to be aware of. And uh, um, we also see that in, in these types, normally the leaf chlorophyll is a little bit less. So in some certain combinations or conditions, when you have very high planting densities, maybe having lower chlorophyll might be an advantage uh, because you, you might have, uh, I mean, you, you don't require so much nitrogen to produce uh, the, yeah, the chlorophyll, first of all. And secondly, maybe there's more light penetration in the lower levels of the canopy if you have lower, um, lower chlorophyll content in the leaf. So the, this is just certainly a very rough speculation why maybe some lines might have man, maintained this allele. This is really pure speculation. I can't answer it otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I would have a question still to follow up on your chlorophyll uh, content in the spike. I think that's a very nice work done there. Uh, and I was wondering to what extent, uh, so if you would compare chlorophyll content between say cultivars, uh, two road, six road and wild relatives, how, how much does that differ? So how much difference do you see there? No idea <laughs> because we, we haven't really done it properly. So I think this is a, something what uh, Sai is going to do in his PhD project, the project I was talking about on my last slide. So we would like to look into this. So is there a correlation also between, for example, spike greening or immature spike greening and leaf chlorophyll content, for example? If there's a slight yes. correlation, you, we can get away with measuring it on the leaf. But if it's not correlated, then you always have to dissect and see. You know, that's that's going to be making it will be making it very tricky for the analysis, I believe. Yes, exactly. And then uh, because it would be interesting to see to what extent indeed this photos potential photosynthetic capacity of your spike would contribute to your final um, survival of your seeds. Yeah, I, I think I think this is very interesting um, to, to consider. I mean, if you really, I mean, we see very clearly that photosynthetic genes are upregulated in the immature spike already. And mm -hmm. you have to consider it's kind of sealed off or shielded within the leaf sheet. So there's actually not really much light actually um, yeah, coming to the little developing spike. But still, it seems there, there must be some light or some light signals must penetrate through the leaf sheets to induce the greening. And obviously, also, there must be some photosynthetic activity going on. And if this would be the case, it would be really interesting because it could also mean that locally, at least, this little developing spike can uh, sustain itself a little bit at, at, in, in some parts. Yeah? Uh, yeah. But that's something we still have to to show obviously because that was one of the questions i had but the, i think you're still gonna look into that indeed is if, if the light signals would actually penetrate through the leaf layers to the meristem or if there's a community a communication between like the outer layers and the inner layers so that it's like uh not the light signal itself but it comes from the outer leaves and goes towards the inner saying like hey please yeah yeah, I, I think uh, there's a dogma in, in photosynthetic research um, that, that, which is saying um, there is no greening without light or any light. Yeah, exactly. So this means there must be some light signal, otherwise the dogma is wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the dogma <laughs> wrong. Maybe we, maybe we have something interesting here, but um, I, I, I don't think so. I'm not, I don't think we're going to be making new physics here. But, no, um, no, unfortunately, no. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I see a question coming up on this point from yeah. uh, Sarah McKim. Sarah, would you like to uh, ask him yourself or should I read it out? Yeah, something to consider as a quality of light hitting the spike as a measure of the surrounding leaves. Yes, true. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose um, the, the light which is hitting the developing spike is most likely not the, the full sunlight or as we know it. Most likely it's, it, it most likely is something like far red related light most likely which is i mean the light which is penetrating through but it this is also interesting because it's it, it suggests that even this very low amount of far red light might induce something and maybe it can make some effect i think that would be really great to examine to what extent the light 
quality with the uh, impact of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Because I don't see. Ah, Sarah McKim again uh, asking uh, Yong Yu, uh, indicating that it's really nice work. Uh, I agree. Uh, what are uh, your thoughts about signaling between the two processes, PTD and proximal internode elongation, before potential competition uh, for resources? Is this all coordinated by PPDH1 in the LEAF? Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. I think uh, my thought is uh, two possibility. One is, uh, of course, I don't have any lessons, but uh, first is the competitions between the Elongation and uh, the spike, and I cannot say this because of PPT one in the div, because um, I think uh, at the earlier stage of spike uh, differentiation, I think the flow signal may not be able to uh, penetrate to the spike because of the fast cluster are not well developed, and I think it's probably just a prosopic effect that plants need to coordinate both traits post the inoculation and the uh, spectros. So probably it's not uh, this signal in the leaf. I hope this uh, answer is, is clear. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so Sarah says it's clear. Thanks for yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I see another question for you, Yong uh, Yu, from Robbie was asking if you have assessed whether the difference in the PPDH1 ST uh, W1 alleles you observed in the proximal internodes um, GWAS is based on expression level or are these specific mm -hmm. amino acid changes that um, you predict would alter the yeah. function itself? Yeah, so uh, ST W1 is based on the uh, bucket is a loss of function the ST W1. So the pig is first uh, mostly contributed by the animal acid substitutions, but also when we combine uh, both uh, PPD1 and ST31, we see this uh, synergistic effect. So I think both the animal acid substitution and also the expression label could uh, both play a role in this elongation process. Okay. Uh, thanks for answering that question. Um, are there more questions? Uh... There, because I'm looking at the time, it's already quarter past four. So if there, I can take one one more question, if really urgent ones. But otherwise, I think we should conclude this party community seminar to also adhere to the time of uh, the meeting, which is normally scheduled for one hour. So we'll be over due. Uh, if there's no more questions, I would really like to thank you, uh, Torsten and Jung Jung, for those uh, great uh, presentations. And if there's any more questions in hindsight, I assume people uh, know where to uh, find you uh, and ask more questions about your excellent work. Thank you for this presentation. Yes. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers, Torsten Young Yu. Cheers. Yes.